we began this series with the passage of scripture from 1 Kings 18 with Elijah having asked for the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah to be assembled on the top of this mountain. We remember that Elijah called all the people of Israel because this act of power was a symbol and a sign like many of Jesus' miracles. And God wanted the people to see. And we remember perhaps that Elijah steps forward and invites the prophets of Baal to go first. You, prepare your altar first. And so they do. And they spend all day and all night wailing and crying to a God that never responds. And then Elijah steps forward. And similar to the three times he stretches out over the young man in Zarephath who had taken his last breath, three times Elijah says, dump water on the altar. Lest we forget that Elijah had repaired the altar, intentionally placed 12 stones to symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel. Three times he calls them to dump water on top of the altar until it says that the ditch around the altar runs over with water, so much water. Elijah does nothing to ignite fire under the pieces of wood. He simply stands in the presence of all, all eyes on him, and calls out to God that God would light the altar. And God does. And in that moment, the sin of Israel becomes so clear how far they and we have wandered from believing in the power of God. And the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah are eventually killed, and Elijah and his servant stand on a hill, and his servant says, I still don't see any rain. Because remember, the point in all of this is that God has promised after three years that it will rain. The servant says to Elijah, I see no rain. And in uh, an interchange that reminds me of Eli and Samuel, Elijah says, go back and look again. Go back and look at the clouds again. And he does once and twice. And the third time he looks up and says, there far in the sky is the tiniest possibility of rain. And Elijah believes that the word of, the God, of God is being fulfilled. We stand in this moment feeling so far, I would imagine, from Elijah, feeling much more like the widow at Seraphith, struggling to make it each day, and yet God pushes us from perhaps the familiarity of that passage to this place where God asks, who are we? And are we willing to continue and stand as the people of God? In 1 Kings 18, 1, it's noteworthy to pay attention to the fact that Elijah has waited for this moment. And as those who collectively, internationally are waiting for COVID restrictions to lift, perhaps in a way that we never have, we have an understanding of the fact that God infrequently moves at the speed of light. Elijah has waited for how many years? Three whole years. Since he stood before the king, Elijah has waited and believed when the ravens brought him food. Three whole years, Elijah has believed when the riverbed dried up and he was sent to Zarephath to the house of a widow who didn't want him and had no food. Three long years, Elijah has waited until God has determined that this is the moment. And when Ahab the king sees Elijah after three years, the king says to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And I love Elijah's answer. Elijah says, wait, wait, wait. Let's be clear about trouble. 
I have not troubled Israel, Elijah says, but you have, King Ahab, you and your father's house, because you have broken the commands of the Lord and followed the Baal sometimes. When God calls us to stand up and to speak what we understand to be God's truth, we are accused of a thousand things, the least of which is being a troubler. February 7th is this Sunday. It is the first Sunday in the month of February. And we celebrate African American history this month. And so as I reflected on this scripture, I couldn't help but think of Representative John Lewis, may he rest in peace. A man who died at 80 years of age, who devoted his life to racial justice and equality and was famous for talking about a call to cause good trouble. One of those who began in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the early days of the Civil Rights Movement, who dedicated his life to justice, who went in to political and public service. In June 2018, he tweeted the following, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Hear that again. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful and be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day or a week or a month or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never be afraid to make some noise and get into, what did he call it? Good trouble. Necessary trouble. Elijah stood before King Ahab. And his first accusation is, why can't you be quiet? Why are you here threatening me with lack of rain? Why don't you just disappear? And Elijah says, let's be clear. The cause of our trouble is a nation that has forgotten who God is. A nation that even though like God has fed me, with bread and meat from the ravens and water from the wadi, even like God has provided with a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil at the hand of a widow who thought she would die, just as God provided manna in the wilderness to our ancestors who wandered. <laughs> We've forgotten who God is. We have forgotten who God is. I want you to let that sink in. Because like Representative Lewis reminds us, it is very easy to get lost in a sea of despair. It is very easy to lose hope. It is very easy to believe that the struggle should be over in a day, in a week, in a month, but certainly not a lifetime. Elijah waits three years before God sends him back to King Ahab to cause trouble that he would call the people of Israel back to the God who fed the men in the wilderness. When has God provided for you? When did God carry your family out of injustice to a place where it could stand? When has God heard your prayers and fed you? Day and night, when has God been your strength? And how quickly do we forget in the waiting beyond the day we wish was all we were asked to struggle. After Elijah confronts King Ahab, in 1 Kings 18, 21, as the people of Israel were divided into two, as the people of Israel were gathered together, Elijah comes near and says to them, powerful words that I believe we need to hear. How long? Will you go on limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, then simply follow him. If God is your refuge and your strength, then find your strength in him. If God is your God, then yield and worship and follow. If God is your God, Elijah says to the people, then follow him. But if you have decided to follow Baal, if you have decided to, vol to follow the ways of this world, if you have decided to follow money or prestige or power or privilege or whiteness, then go. Because this day, 
We must be all in to follow God. Priscilla Schreier, in her study, talks about how exhausting it is to waver between two opinions, to try one on and take it off and try another and take it off, to practice this for a short time. How many of us have done this and do this in our faith? We promise some Lenten season that we will daily seek God and we do it for a few days and we fade and wonder why God feels absent. We declare with our lips that God will provide, but wring our hands. <laughs> and hear me when I say I am not talking about you, I am talking about me. Those who know me closely know that in times, all of the feelings that I hold within become a way in which I try on everybody else's pain. And you know what? Wavering between two opinions, never gives us the strength to take the faithful step forward. Priscilla Schreier emphasizes not only the call to stand firm, but emphasizes in verse 23 the way in which Elijah stands in confidence. And perhaps of all the things she shared in this part of the scripture, this touched me the most. She said, Elijah seemed to stand in a confidence that only God can give. He seems to stand in a lack of fear, knowing that he is outnumbered, lest we forget there are 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, and a people of Israel who have spent the last three years literally facing starvation because this God that Elijah claims has not opened the skies. It is a perfect moment to tremble. But God prepared Elijah, and maybe God is preparing God's church for a boldness and a confidence we have never had. Elijah stands, and Priscilla Schreier says, take note of the fact that Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, you go first. Go ahead. You go first. If you've ever been involved in negotiation or are in conversation with someone who is skilled at strategy, they'll always try and make you go first. You spill your thoughts first. You talk about your needs first. Go ahead, Elijah says. You go first. And the prophets of Baal indeed go first. And instead of a powerful show of power, they appear to be a frenzied mass of lost individuals. And Elijah simply stands, unwavering in his commitment and trusting that God will provide. As I thought of examples of individuals who have stood for faith, I thought of Rosa Parks. I just want to remind us that African American history is our history. It's not a specialized story. It is our story. And as people of faith, if we want to find clear and, and, and reticent examples of faith in God, moving individuals to stand in courage like Elijah had, there's many from the African-American Christian tradition to teach us. Rosa Parks, as I assume most of you know, is the young woman who, the, the, the woman who never set out to become what is now referred to as the first lady of civil rights. She simply defied an Alabama law by refusing to give up her seat on the bus to a white passenger on December 1st, 1955. Lest we think it's old history. And as a result of not moving to the back of the bus, as a result of the act of her defiance, it set off a spark with so many others who began to stand in faith. 
Rosa Parks is quoted as saying, Stand for something, or you will fall for anything. Today's mighty oak is yesterday's nut that held its ground. I've never heard that quote from her, but I love it. I'll say it again. Stand for something. Choose this day who you will serve. And of course, as your pastor, I invite you, stand for God, or you will fall for anything. Today's mighty oak tree is yesterday's not yesterday's acorn that held its ground. She went on to say, you must never be fearful about what you are doing when it is right. I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. Choose this day who you will serve. If you're going to follow the Lord, follow him. Make a decision and stand. And if you're going to follow your fears and bail, then follow them. Elijah literally lets the prophets of Baal go first and stands in a courage that only he has. The third piece of this passage that is meaningful is about the way in which the prophets of Baal react. In 1 Kings 18, Starting with verse 26, I'm going to read you the description of the prophets of Baal. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many. Then call on the name of your God, but put no fire to it. So they took the bull that was given to them. They prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no answer. They limped about the altar that they had made, and at noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud! Surely he's a god. Either he's meditating or has wandered away, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. Then the prophets of Baal cried aloud, as was their custom, and they cut themselves with swords and lances until the blood gushed out over them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no answer, and no response. And then and only then did Elisha say to all the people, come closer to me. And all the people came closer as Elijah prepared the altar of the Lord. Priscilla Schreier says, we live in a frenzy. We believe in trouble that we must find a thousand solutions. We cut ourselves, we cry out, we're exhausted, we run, we hide, we seek, we <laughs> do everything but stand in the conviction of who God is and what God will do. This touched me deeply as well. Priscilla Schreier actually says that before the COVID restrictions kept us in a single place, many of us lived lives that were so fast-paced and so out of control that even if we were not in a frenzy calling out to anyone who would hear, the pace of our lives was so hurried and carried, that we were too exhausted to stand in the conviction of who God is. I have learned, and particularly in this pandemic, and I'm grateful for those in my life who repeat it back to me, I have learned the moments that I am tired, the moments that I'm exhausted, that I've frenzied myself with worry, are the moments that I become most afraid. Just that simple knowledge that God does not ask of us a frenzied calling out. God asks for a confident stand like that oak tree that was once an acorn, Rosa Parks said, planted firmly in the ground. Psalm 62 verses 1 through 2 says that God is a fortress upon which we stand and we will not be 
shaken. Now believe me, I'm in this with you. I know how hard these months have been. I know how easy it is to get shaken. I know that Elijah seems to have this strength that I don't yet have built within, but maybe I'm still in the Wadi Cherith, or maybe I'm still in Zarephath, but God is teaching me above all else stand. Ephesians 6, when you've done it all, stand in the power of the prayer that God gives you. Makes me think of Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan was the General Secretary of the United Nations from January 1997 to December 2006. And many of you probably don't know that in my early years, the United Methodist Church sent me as a young adult missionary to work at the Church Center for the United Nations. Kofi Annan was the Secretary General at that time, Fanti and Ashanti from Ghana, Kofi Annan became Christian in a Methodist school and later went on to identify as being Anglican. And as I thought of examples of people who have stood in the midst of frenzy and had a peace and a poise that came from their faith, I thought of Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan only recently passed on. Kofi Annan is quoted as saying, each person must live their life as a model for others. And those who know anything about the way that Kofi Annan led, there was a piece about how he stood that settled the frenzy and enabled the wisdom that God gives to prevail. I invite you, as we continue in these three years of waiting, to pay attention to the times when you, like the prophets of Baal, reach a pitch of frenzy that makes it impossible to lead. Kofi Annan was also quoted as saying that when leaders do not lead, the people will rise up and lead themselves. Elijah just stood. And finally, 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 we get to the last part that Priscilla Schreier Schreier emphasizes. And she talks about the fact that when Elijah does call on God, there is such a trust in his language He's no longer chastising the people of Israel. He's no longer teaching them. He's literally in dialogue with the God who made him. He's called the people closer, and it says in verse 31, Elisha took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel, the one who struggles with God, shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to contain two measures of seed. He put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, said, fill four flower jars. I love that they are flower jars. Like the flower jar that the widow of Zarephath held that only contained a little, fill four flower jars because I know what God can do with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he says, do it a second time, do it a third time. Like the third time he stretched out over that child, they did it and the water ran and the altar was filled with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob, God whom I know by name, God who has led my ancestors, God who is personal and up close with me, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Rachel and Hagar and Sarah, God, oh God, let it be known this day that you are the God in Israel, that I am your servant and that I have done these things because you have asked. You can try to speak truth to power and when it's not God's time or God's call, It does not end up like Elijah ended up. Oh God, answer me so that the people may know you 
Elijah's motives are not prestige or ego or power or even faith and fire. They are the humble submission that God would be known. Answer me so that the people may know you, that you are God, and that you are turning their hearts back to him. The last person that I want to reflect on is Harriet Tubman. An African-American abolitionist and political activist, she was actually born right here in Dorchester, Maryland. She escaped and made some 13 missions to rescue approximately 70 enslaved people. She was illiterate. So it's also interesting to try and find her words because they are what somebody else reflected. Because she was a woman of strength and insight and wisdom and intellect, and she was one who relied always on God. She says, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. And then she goes on to say, like Elijah said that day, it wasn't me, it was the Lord. I always told God, I trust you. I trust you. I don't know where to go or what to do, God but I expect you to lead me. And God always did. It's assumed that Harriet Tubman said, if you're tired, keep going. If you're scared, keep going. If you're hungry, keep going. If you want to taste freedom, keep going. She said, I would fight for my liberty so long as my strength lasted. And if the time came for me to go, the Lord would let them take me. You know what her last words were before she took her last breath? At 91 years of age in 1913, she quoted Jesus. Her last words on this earth, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will bring you to me also. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. Elijah never relied on his own strength. Harriet Tubman trusted God in the middle of the dark forest in the face of incredible injustice. God prepares us and calls us. Do we hear? Do we hear? Lord, we want to be a people that not just survive this pandemic, but a people who grow in our faith such that you continue to use us. Mm -hmm.